This is a recorded session from WordCamp St. Petersburg of Chris Jenkins and his talk, Start With The Why, Leave With A Bigger Check. So author Simon Sinek introduces us to the concept of the golden circle. He says basically that in any buying decision, um, there's three rings that kind of determine the, how that decision is made or what decision is made. So the outside is the what, the product, and the middle is the how, which is the process, but the center is the why. That's the actual motivation. It's the real like driving purpose or, or need behind that purchasing decision. Um, he goes on to say that um, decisions making is driven by the why because it speaks to our limbic system, which is uh, the portion of our brain where snap decisions are made. Um, it controls things like emotion, behavior, motivation, uh, long-term memory, and interestingly enough, your sense of smell. Your, it's like one of the most primal senses you have, smell, which is why it like, prompts such a strong uh, emotional connection sometimes. Um, if you ever like, you know, have that experience where you smelled the scent of your partner on a piece of clothing or something, and that emotional response, it's all coming from the same section of your brain. And the why portion of decision-making is controlled by this brain, that sort of snap, fight or flight response. And the why in a buying decision often starts with a, a belief statement or, or a core mission or purpose. Um, Apple, actually, in their marketing, always starts with the why. They don't talk about their products first or anything else along that line. Um, they say things like, everything we do, we believe is challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. They've established the why. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. That's the how. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? And that's the what. And that what is like the least important part of the entire process in their marketing pitch, because what they're doing initially is establishing what their beliefs are. And if you believe the same things that they believe, you're more likely to buy from them. This is important. Now, when our prospective customers come to us, often they'll bring us a what and sometimes a how. They say things like, um, I need a website, or uh, I need a landing page, or I need some sort of custom plugin. And we respond in kind. We say, I'll build you a website. I can build you that plugin, or I'll make you that landing page. But when they're coming to us, they're actually coming to us with two whys. They have their project why, and they have their business why. And the project why is the specific business problem or problems that they want to solve. And the business why, of course, is the overall driving purpose behind that business. Um, by understanding those two whys, we not only discover the opportunity for greater scope, um, but we also have a greater understanding of not just the request, but the actual desired outcome, which can be different than the request. That may seem obvious, but there's something we have to remember that's very important, which is, uh, customers do not speak the same language that we do. Just fundamentally, they don't. Um, when I was 16, my very first job was working as a cashier at Arby's, and we had this uh, a family come in one night, and they were trying to order uh, food, and they didn't speak English hardly at all. They're just absolutely terrible. And we'd gotten through like the sandwiches and stuff, but the father kept pointing at the the sign behind me that had milkshakes on it. And he kept asking me how much a how much a shake, and I said a dollar ninety nine. And uh, he said, no, 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 how much is shake? A dollar ninety-nine. And, and he literally took my shoulder and he turned me and he pointed to the sign and he said, how much is shake? <laughs> oh, got it. Yeah. He was doing his very best to tell me what he actually wanted or what he actually needed, but he spoke a different language and it was up to me to try and figure out what it really was that he was trying to get to. And that, that actually kind of stuck with me for a long time because uh, um, I saw so many times that when customers come to us, they don't really tell us what their actual problem are, is, typically. They don't tell us what that why or what that motivation is. They come to us trying to tell us a solution, right? They say, I want this thing, or I want you know some function or some feature. And that thing that they're saying to you, that particular translation, can come from anywhere. It can come from their past experience with other projects. It can come from things they've seen on other web business websites that they assume are the solution to their problem as well. 
Um, or it can come from like people that they've worked with and their colleagues and friends and family who have told them various things. And so they're sort of stringing together all this terminology and they come to you and they're like, I want this thing. And you're like, I'm gonna build you that thing. And then you build them that thing and they're like, that's not the thing I actually wanted. <laughs> so fundamentally, once you start to understand that they don't speak our language, you learn to begin translating the things that they say when they come to you to really try to get down to that core business purpose. And I have some examples here of things that I've actually had in the past. I want a pop-up form to get people to subscribe to my email list. Okay, we can do that. But really, I want to make sure visitors are encouraged in an obvious way to subscribe to my email list, and I've seen pop-up forms, and that seems like what I want. But it actually wasn't. What we ended up doing was incorporating an auto subscription sign up at the checkout of their e-commerce platform and that worked wonderfully. Yeah. Conversion rates are way higher than this really annoying mobile form that Google will now punish you for having. <laughs> Similarly, I want a slideshow at the top with a bunch of product photos. How many people here hate slideshows? Something like 80% of users never get past the second slide. Customers still ask for this all the time, right? Now, what they're saying is, I want to make sure the prospective customer is immediately presented with actionable information that highlights my product. And typically, a slideshow is not actually what they're looking for. I get this one, tons. Oh. <laughs> I want an app on my website. <laughs> so what you're telling me is you want to spend $30,000 on development for something that no one's ever going to download? I don't think that's actually what you're telling me. <laughs> I think what you're trying to tell me is, I want to make sure that my site is as accessible on mobile as it is on desktop. And that's an entirely different solution than an app for my website. I have a client whose name I won't mention who's constantly asking for features seemingly at random. Uh, he's the king of requests like, can't you just make this like Facebook? Uh, and I've often joked with him that he pays me to tell him no. Uh, my wife who's here tonight has heard that we have video conferences around the house about once a week. And our catchphrase is, that's a terrible idea. We hear that constantly. Um, oh, oops, uh, I didn't even have that there at all. Uh, <laughs> the reason that our relationship has lasted for four years now is that I fundamentally trained him to stop asking me for things, to start telling me the why, start telling me the business case. Um, by consistently speaking to that core motivation, I built trust with him over time, which not only causes him to take my advice to heart, it also fundamentally makes it harder for my competition to take him away as a client because we've built this relationship where he knows <laughs> that our whys are aligned. I'm going to work for the best solution for what his core business motivation is. This app, by the way, written on WordPress, started off as a request form, which posted leads back to a CRM. Four years later, it's the central business management application, runs all events at Nova, um, services, clients, vendors, venue management. He's probably spent 100 grand on development for four years. That's the power of that kind of relationship. Getting to the why helps prevent bad strategy, and it improves the quality of your discovery. Um, it also helps guide the conversations when you're presenting alternate options for strategy and additional scope, and it positions you as the understanding partner instead of the contentious vendor. Have any of y'all been the contentious vendor before? Have you ever argued with a client over a request, oh, yeah. a functionality, a design? You know they're asking you for something just obviously a terrible idea, right? And you're in this position where they're saying, well, I just want you to do this. Well, when you become that trusted partner because your whys are aligned, it's less of that sense of why am I arguing with this vendor and more like a sense of I've got this really good friend who we don't always agree, but I always know he's looking out for me. And that changes the, the nature of that relationship significantly. Um, I always talk too fast that my mouth gets dry after drink. <laughs> It's not vodka, I swear. Uh, I had a client about five years ago who kind of reminded me that I didn't even realize at the time that I was sort of instinctively always going for this deeper reasoning behind the request that I got. Uh, but I just done a project with her and, and it turned out very successful and they were very happy with it. And she came back to my LinkedIn profile and wrote me a review, which, hey, that was great. Back when LinkedIn was about reviews and not about spamming people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She said, I met Chris at a networking event. His direct to the point comments and teasers caused me to contact him about our web needs. The first time I spoke with him, he was professional and knowledgeable. 
He didn't ask about the nuts and bolts of what I needed. He asked polite questions about our business strategy. And I realized quickly that Chris wasn't targeting our goals on a vague low level discussion level. He was making sure he provided what our company needed on the highest level possible. Filling a need isn't all he does. He digs deep to understand the need from a strategic point of view. The result is not only an exceptional, successful website, but a strategic partner for ongoing high-level discussion. Yay me, I mean, great feedback, right? They had had their first website built five years before I talked to them for like 1,500 bucks, and I knew they weren't getting out the door for less than 5,000. So fundamentally, I had to really understand the business case behind why they were coming back to me so that I could make sure that I aligned both of our sides of the conversation, and they knew that I'm not just trying to make a buck here, right? I'm trying to solve your problem, and this is what it's going to cost to solve your problem. Kind of funny anecdote, by the way, when my company shared out the Tampa Bay WordPress meetup post today, they totally changed the title on the social post. <laughs> because I think that the idea of start with the why and leave with the bigger check sounded just like go beat your prospects up and get more money out of them. Right. But it's really not about that. The whole point about leaving with the bigger check when you start the why is it's a result of starting with the why, not the goal of it. The goal of it is to actually solve their problems in a comprehensive way and to really deeply understand what the business case for that project is. So by doing that, it just naturally results in more money because it's more billable hours, more solutions, basically. We become a project manager at that point for them, too. Yeah, a lot of that happens as well. When you get to the why, I mean, fundamentally, you move from vendor to partner. And by demonstrating that your why is aligned, your personal business why and their business why, uh, it just it moves you into that place where the relationship becomes more of a long-term thing than just a one-off, let's do some things and I'll collect a check. You know? um, are any co-members of the Advanced WordPress Facebook group? Yeah. Just one? Just two. Oh, two. Okay, fair enough. Um, one of the most contentious threads, uh, I think, I happened back in April. It was like one of the most blown up threads I've ever seen on there. And it was about uh, how much do you charge to build WordPress websites, right? And I found, like, amazingly, the vast majority of people were in the $2,000 range, followed quickly by the $5,000 range. And that wasn't really the part that, like, blew my mind. The part that blew my mind was, the people who were in the $2,000 to $5,000 range, when they were hearing what the rest of us were charging for the projects that we were working on, literally a bunch of comments in that thread were like, you're ripping off customers. Ripping off customers. You know, when you're charging ten dollars or $20,000 for these uh, products, your projects, um, you're just like basically scamming them. Um, they assume fundamentally that we were performing the same work that they were performing, that we were approaching it the same way, that we were solving the same problems, that we were marketing the same way, all those things. They really kind of thought of WordPress websites as this sort of fungible commodity, which it's fundamentally not. I mean, it's the opposite of that. Every WordPress project is wildly different, whether you're doing a canned, you know, theme forest theme and a bunch of plugins, or you're writing it like we do from the ground up. Um, they're all, they should all be specifically geared towards like the exact business case that's there. But the thing that's important to me, well, the message I think that's important to me that all of you understand, when you build a site, you're not delivering a product. You're impacting the business. When you deliver a quality web project, you're causing their phone to ring, you're causing their CRM to fill up, you're saving them time while making them money, you're making transactions occur in their e-commerce system. The output of your work affects their daily why. You affect their lives in a meaningful way. And when you understand their problems and you communicate that you want to help make their day-to-day -day lives easier, that's that moment when you're no longer a vendor, when you move past it, when they feel like you're on their side. A customer may come in with a budget to solve a single problem, but when you demonstrate that you understand their why and that you can solve the other problems, you'll find that that budget can get very flexible because they were only planning on this one thing, but all of a sudden there's this whole other spectrum of things that you can do that helps them, that fundamentally impacts their day-to-day -day why. Um, I had a client last October who came in with probably one of the most complicated RFPs I've seen in a long time. He had about 4,500 pages of content on a proprietary system called SBI. It's about 10, 15 years old. Um, the content exports were a blend of like CSVs and flat HTML files. And by the way, 
Over that 10, 15 years, he had built this site up so that it was killing it in organic search. He was getting about a half million organic visitors a month, spent zero on paid marketing. It was all just this site and Google playing nice, nice together. So fundamentally, part of the request was we had to maintain the document structure and the link structure and everything else across this like crazy mishmash of HTML files and all sorts of server side includes and everything else. So I looked at this and I said, okay, this is a big, big, big project. And the why of this, his business relies on organic SEO for the traffic. And it's a lead brokerage, which means that if he's not getting the traffic and getting the conversions, he's not making any money. I said, it's gonna be a big deal for us to get this right. And so I quoted it out what I thought was fair. I sent over a proposal, I outlined what it was we intended to do, why I thought these things were important, and waited, and about 24 hours later, he sends me back an email, he goes, is there any room for movement on this price? I said, no, I, I think that's about right. He said, well, I just want you to know you're about almost twice what your nearest competitor has been on. I said, okay. I don't think they understand the scope of your project. I don't think that they're really gonna get what your actual business requirements are here, but you know, if money is what the dividing line is here, then you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. I didn't hear from him for four weeks. I was pretty confident at that point I'd lost the deal. And four weeks later, he signed the contract and we delivered in April and he's my customer now and he's super happy. We have a product that fundamentally not just maintains all of those initial core requirements, but we also dug into the rest of the ways that he did business. He had a big issue with workflow. They have these QA things that get submitted and it has to go through an editorial process and then it goes to a judge who's not very tech savvy, but he has to provide the legal answer because it's in the legal space. And it had to accommodate all these things in a simple, easy to understand way for people who are not tech savvy to go through a fairly complex process. And we built out a lot, custom respect. He spent twice what he would have spent at that next guy, but he got twice what he would have spent. And I, I'd like to say he got more than twice what he would have gotten from that next person because for them to bid that low meant that they didn't fundamentally understand the whys of his project and his business. They didn't get what the full scope of the project was. Now, that being said, it's a big deal to try and take that idea and actually turn it into a more profitable discovery. So how can we monetize the why? One of the best ways is to start with belief statements with leading questions. When you make belief statements, you're giving your prospects something to hook into. They're either going to agree with your beliefs or they're not. And if it breaks down at this point in time in the discovery process, let it go. That wasn't your client to begin with at all. But if you get here and you can start from here and they're already with you from this point, it's gonna move on from there. So we believe it's important to understand how you do business to make sure this project meets your needs. Can you tell me more about what you do? That's the most basic way to start, right? Tell me about your business. I wanna know what you do. We believe that it's critical to the success of this project to understand how you measure conversions so we can help you determine ROI. This is a huge one for me. I never leave a discovery without asking this question. Sorry for that. Oh, no worries. <laughs> we actually have in our project outlines what we call our PCU, our primary conversion unit. It's the thing that the client has told us is how they're going to measure the success of this project. And so we fundamentally structure the project around that. Because if they're not seeing what they believe to be a strong ROI from that, they're not gonna be happy with the money they've spent and what you've given them. And our goal is always to build long-term relationships. It's not about that single one-off project, it's about the ongoing work over time. So the PCU is really fundamentally a critical thing. If it's emails, if it's phone calls, we have a lot of people who are just like home service companies, phone calls, they don't want anything else. They just want the phone to ring, that's it. Um, E-commerce, obviously it's a transaction, right? Somebody checks out and buys products at a some certain level. That's the key point of, uh, that's the key way that they convert in their business. Um, this one actually came up recently. We believe a good pitch filters out people who aren't qualified to do business with you. What are some of the qualifiers that you use with your customers? If they tell you specifically who their customers are and who their customers aren't, you can use that when you're building out their project to help make their sales funnels more effective. And you can make that part of the infrastructure. For example, um, one of the uh, mind of event, that, that application that I showed you that uh, started out as a form, one of the ways the form works is that it reduced the total number of form submissions by almost 60% but it increased the number of conversions of the submissions that did come through almost to 80%. 
And the way that we did it was so subtle, but it fundamentally spoke to the qualifiers they cared about. There's a budget field on the form, and underneath the budget field, it has a little line of instructions. It says, please enter your budget with no character, special characters, just numbers. For example, 11000. If the sight of $11,000 in the instructions under the budget field scared them off, they weren't going to be a good client for Nova. Subtle things like that make a big difference. And when you understand the why, and you understand that fundamental thing behind what the client's trying to get to, you can build things in like that that contribute to the success of the project that are small details. You know, those details matter, though. Moving on from belief statements, I like to ask how questions which build on the belief statements. Can you describe your business life cycle from lead to fulfillment? This is where I take, tell me what you do, and I turn it into an actual business life cycle. Now I'm going to understand how they do what they do. What software do you use for your CRM, sales tracking, accounting, etc.? How are you managing your shipping, fulfillment, other business processes? These questions here often start them thinking about other sections of scope that they weren't thinking about previously. Because they came in just thinking, I want a website. But now they're thinking about their business. And they're responding to your concern and curiosity about their business. You're building a connection here. Follow that up with the what questions. Now we start to get down to the nitty gritty of it, right? We take those why and how questions and we start turning those into propositions that are gonna end up becoming part of our strategy. Would it be helpful if your sales totals and your e-commerce system automatically sync to your accounting system? Yes. <laughs> Would it be helpful if your lead form used those qualifiers to filter out prospects who aren't a good match for you? Yes. Those things now start getting them thinking down this line and start getting them excited. Because they came in here looking for a brochure and now they're seeing how their business could run better on the web with some of these additional things that they had never even considered walking in the door. At this point, I like to ask the open-ended questions. Because now that you've got them thinking down this path, <laughs> shut up and let them talk. Are there any other specific business problems you're dealing with connected to these processes? Is there anything else you'd like this site to do? My God, is there money in this question? <laughs> Yesterday, 6.30 PM, I had to stay late at the office for a phone call. This was the last question that I asked, and they said, you know, now that you mention it, we had probably 15, 20 hours billable onto that project with this one question because they were like, oh, we've got this calendar thing that we're managing through Google and we kind of just wish it would be in this centralized place. They'd never thought about it right up until that point in time. But I started with the why. I started getting them thinking about the fundamental purpose of the project in their business. I moved into the house to kind of demonstrate here are some things that can work and can happen on your website. Here are some solutions that are possible. And then now that they're thinking in this direction, I go, now, the whole world's open to you. What would you like your site to do? And they go, oh, this and this and this and this and this. Unfortunately, we do have to kind of manage that process a little bit, because they can be a little bit crazy sometimes. But you will find so much scope that you didn't even know was there when they walked in the door by taking them to this place where you're getting them thinking in that direction. You've set the context. You're partners now. You've set that mental connection in their head. They're really thinking about their business from a digital services perspective. And now the sky's the limit, so they're really going to start thinking about it. There's one more piece to this equation. Four words. no one ever pays enough attention to, but I swear to God, these four words will change the effectiveness of, and how often you close business. And they are, listen, listen, fucking listen. This is the single biggest mistake that I see people make all the time. They try to sell across the top of the client, they try to dazzle the client with how much talent's in their company and how many things they've done and how many projects they've done and all the rest of these things. Your job is not to sell. Your job is not to close. Your job is not to impress them with how impressive your company is. Your job is to hear your prospect and to create the best possible solutions for their project wise, period. That's fundamentally it. Now, that being said, I've had a lot of people ask me along the way, um, well, I mean, don't you deal with sticker shop? 
Sure. Yeah. Because we, they were all excited up to this point, right? We're like, well, we started off with this little project, and I had about three or 4,000 budgeted for it, and now I've got like 15 different API integrations and a new e-commerce platform, and woo! And then and now we have to drop a price tag on them, and they're like, oh, that's where it all gets bad, right? Well, no. There are ways to disarm the sticker shop. One of the things that we like to do, and this is probably what we do most commonly, is we stage proposals, right? We say, okay, we know what our core requirements were, we know what you came in here with, and we've already kind of expanded the scope a little bit, because there's a bunch of things in this original core scope that weren't there anymore. But then we also have these secondary things that we started talking about that you're very interested in, and you know what? If I'm gonna collect 60, 80,000 from you, it's not like I need to collect it all this month. I just need it in my pipeline for this year, right? Whether or not I collect that now or in August or October, doesn't matter at all. I just wanna collect it over time. So I stage it. We say, okay, hey, we're going to do this core build now. That'll take us through the summer. In the fall, we're going to start working on the second section. And in the winter, here's stage three, these final other things that we have in play, right? So for them, all they're dealing with is, here's the price tag for this one point now. It's a little higher than I expected coming out the gate, but it's workable. We're going to make it happen because, I mean, you're clearly solving problems here, and it's important to me, right? But you've already established in their mind that I'm going to keep working with these people and here are the next rounds of things that I'm going to do. And so instead of hitting them with that all at once, you just spread it out over time. It makes it into bite-sized pieces that are easier for them to digest. The other side of that, or sort of the alternative, is um, um, we use Proposify, for instance, for our software. Anyone use that? I've never heard of that one. It's a proposal creating software. Um, they have like optional add-ons as one of the functions. So you can basically just take every single solution that you got some excitement for during the discovery process and just put them into sort of optional add-ons, you know, a little checkbox. Let them decide. If you've got somebody who's going to a grocery store and they've got 20 bucks and they want six things, but when they get up to the counter, they only can afford four of them, right? Well, they're going to pick the four that they want. But fundamentally, they're going to spend that entire 20 bucks. And that's what it comes down to. And sometimes we actually use a combination of those two approaches, right? We'll set up staging, and then we'll allow optional add-ons at each stage. That way they can sort of, you know, maybe they can even go back and go to their board and say, I really kind of want this one. It's not critical to this stage, but we'd really like to have it, you know. And sometimes, as long as that understanding of the business why is there, um, you can get those deals to go through. Now, what are the real world outcomes of starting with the why? Well, here's what it's been for us. Our average project billing has increased from 5,000 to 30,000 for standalone projects or stages. Our high-end project billing increased from around 25,000 to 95,000 at the end of last year. That was a huge win for us, and I just fundamentally kind of proved out what we were doing. But honestly, the third part here is the most important part to me. Clients, on average, extended the relationship by 12 months and spent anywhere from 20 to 60 thousand dollars in adjuncted services and additional development. Because once we established that relationship, once we did that staged project, and once we delivered, very important by the way, if you don't deliver on these things, all of that goes away. But once we delivered stage one, they jumped to stage two. And once you deliver stage two, they jumped to stage three. And so on average, we saw that a customer who normally would come in the door and maybe spend 20,000 total, might end up spending 100,000 over 12 months, as long as we continue to address those core business purposes and really fundamentally solve problems. So, oh, yeah. that's the end, actually. <laughs> I got right to the end of that. So at this point, I have QA. Start with the Wiley with the bigger check. Happy to take questions. So what was the name of the proposal software you said again? Proposify.biz. Okay, thank you. Very good software, it's worked really well for us. How large are your clients in average? Mm, we try to shoot for our clients who do a minimum of five years, uh, or five million a year revenue. Um, the sweet spot is kind of like 50 to 100 million, and then like we have a handful of uh, like Fortune 1000 clients. But you didn't start there. Oh, no, no. No, <laughs> yeah. no as a matter of fact, yeah. the, the organization, uh, the reason that we started our initial growth spectrum was that we were a carrier partner. We probably almost worked exclusively with HVAC companies, and we that, that was kind of like uh, 
it's like the killing fields because in HVAC it's very competitive. Everyone's always trying to eat your lunch and take your client. Um, it really fundamentally comes down to ROI every single month. They're looking at what you get, what I spend, what I get back, what I spend, what I get back, you know. Um, and so the clients that we've had who we've taken and kept from that time when we were primarily carrier partners fit that sort of core model. They're five to ten million a year minimum. And they've had this kind of a relationship with us where we've started off with, we're just going to build you this brochure website and we've really gotten deep in what do you care about? You know, they care about phone calls. That's what they care about more than anything else. They want the phone to ring. And so we put every bit of effort into that social media. They don't want to spend money on social media. They want the phone to ring. You know, PPC, they they'll spend a lot on PPC if you make the phone ring. That's it. What's PPC? Uh, pay per click. So Google uh, paid services, that's primarily it. Okay, gotcha. Um, some paid Facebook, but honestly, like social is just not really a good match for home services industry. Right, okay. One of the nice things about your model is um, customer service. You have the, um, the, the two to five thousand dollar people, you need a lot of those, and everybody has the same needs. Okay, so basically you have a two to $5,000 client or you have a $20,000, $25,000 client, guess what? They're going to have the same needs and you need a lot more of these, whether you can fulfill them for this lower price, it's not something else, but you have a lot more of these smaller clients and you can't keep up with the customer service. 100% that's, absolutely correct. That's, what's, that's where you build your relationship. That's, uh, that's why we actually moved on from that initial model. That was why it was such an important priority for us to scale our clients up versus scaling our number of clients laddering. Account management was eating us up, eating us alive. Yeah. You know, I would much rather spend 20 hours a month on the phone with a million dollar a year client than I would with you know a $60,000 a year client. Sure, absolutely. A good observation. If, um, have you found that when you get extended beyond your current skill set that it's it's uh, better to, to just build time in and develop the, the competency, or do you work with partners? Um, you mentioned that you'll get asked to do all sorts of crazy things, or maybe you have work with all different APIs. That, you know, how do you? That is a really good question. We've actually got a, a little group where we talk about, um, it's called the Digital Agency Growth Accelerator. We deal with a lot of smaller folks who are trying to kind of get the ball rolling, you know? And that's one of the things that we see a lot is that agencies are often developed around a, a, a single person or a partnership that where there's a very limited skill set, and then you start hitting some of these walls when the skill set is not there. Um, Symphony had probably its biggest struggle right before they brought me on, and it's part of the reason they brought me on to begin with. I had my own uh, WordPress development agency for five years. I was very comfortable. We were doing just fine. I scaled up to over, you know, getting close on about a quarter million a year in revenue for a one-man shop. Very comfortable, you know. Um, they had hit a wall. They were outsourcing the vast majority of their development. Some of it was overseas. Some of it was, you know, places around. Quality, impossible to measure or predict. Project management, impossible. Projects were always late, always ran over. Um, you know, it's those kinds of things happen. It, it gets really sketchy. Now, I'm not anti-outsourcing, but what I will say is if you need, I definitely recommend up your skill set personally, just to answer that question fundamentally. <laughs> I really, like, learn to code, yes. Uh, that's, that's really the most important part. And honestly, working with APIs is probably one of the simplest things you can learn in code. Once you open that up, you open up tons of functionality with very little complexity, because most APIs work roughly the same. One JSON API is the same as the next one. Slightly different fields, but who cares? You send a query, you get data back, you build a display out of it. That's it, you know. Um, but you are going to run up some places where fundamentally you do need more. Uh, when somebody comes to you and they want a fully functional, publicly accessible web application, if you are not a senior software developer, like yes, find a partner for that. Um, try and make it a local partner. Make it somebody that, that you can go to their office and talk with them about. Um, but I'd say the place where the, the line kind of between what you should be delivering and what you shouldn't be delivering is when the liability of doing it poorly costs you not only the relationship with the customer, but potentially your business. You know? And in those particular cases, yeah, find a partner. But a good partner, a local partner, somebody that's well recommended and somebody that you trust. But learn to code. <laughs> You, you hit uh, briefly about measuring success. 
Do you have a preferred method or a preferred tool? And how do you convey that to your client? Because you want to get to the next step. You know, that's kind of what all that's based on. So how do you prove your work to them? We have a suite of tools. And honestly, uh, one of the most important things that we do is ROI reports monthly. You spent this much, this is what you got back. And so that primary conversion unit, again, right, we assign a value to it. What's a phone call worth to your business, right? Well, it's maybe a repair call, it's maybe a new call, a new installation call, it's maybe this, maybe that. There's a little spectrum of things that you can put there. We use systems like um, call, uh, call tracking metrics, or like the Google local business numbers, you know? So you pass the phone calls through a tracking system, like even when they're dialing the number, it's gonna hit your system first before it hits them. And then we use a platform called Clipfolio, which uses, uh, it essentially has an open API model where you can take APIs from anywhere and suck them all in and put them into this reporting dashboard. And so we have everything, their social, their PPC, their organic uh, traffic, conversions from their forms, conversions from transactions, conversions from phone calls, everything all on a nice dashboard. And that's fundamentally like the number one thing that we deliver every month. We say, you spent this, you got this. And if you're not happy with that, then take your business elsewhere. In an email format? Um, no, it's it's actually a, a pure login web platform. Oh, okay. Like they can log in anytime, 24 hours a day, and see the last 30 days from the second that they're accessing it, what's been happening with my platform. And right. very informative too. Is yeah. That, is that auto updated, or do you guys manually? Well, yeah, because it's all API driven. So every time they load the page, it just hits all those APIs and says, "Give me the current data." Everything. Yeah. Yeah. And you, it's like, I mean, can you do like weekly, monthly, yearly type? Oh yeah, you can set it. Like it's highly configurable. Just what we found is most usually our clients are looking for the last thirty days of data. That's mostly what they're looking for. Do you have that on the back of your WordPress site, like in the admin side, or is that a whole another side? You just no, do? it's a it's a subdomain essentially that we set up. We've got like reporting.symphonyagency.com. Um, it's really a mass alias. It's like an alias that points to their platform. Right. Okay. It's not, it's not like native wrong. to WordPress, although. Maybe there's a plug-in opportunity there. <laughs> yeah, it probably could be. Well, because that's one of your value pieces that you actually provide to the client is the fact that you're giving them that level of reporting so that they know exactly where their money's going and yep. what it's doing for them. Well, it's, you know, and when we talk about aligning our whys, right, those belief statements, one of our belief statements is we believe that how your money is spent with us should be 100% transparent. And if you believe that, and we believe that, you're going to do business with us. But... If we don't show you that in how we report, you're gonna stop believing that we believe that, right? And so we do things like, uh, we, don't, we don't charge the clients for PPC um, expenditure. We set their account credit card up with Google. It's like a lot of companies out there will say, we're gonna spend 10,000 on PPC this month, and then they only spend five and they keep the other five. You know, that kind of thing happens all the time. Um, we don't host clients. We're not sysadmins. We don't have a stack of servers. It's ridiculous for us to host our clients' websites. We set them up with their own hosting account. They have their own direct connection. They're billed individually by the host. And should they choose to leave our services, they don't lose their host or their website. They just stop using us. That's also establishing trust, quite a bit of trust. All of these things are fundamental to proving the ROI, you know? It's smart. It's a lot of work though, because you're basically, you don't have that uh, recurring revenue. Sure we do. From us. Well, well, you do. Well, not from hosting, are you kidding me? No, no, Hosting's no, 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 like no, five no, bucks a month. month. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, for, where's the recurring revenue coming from other than new development? New development is one thing. Oh yeah, we got new development, but we also do, I mean, we do full-fledged marketing. We're a full-featured agency. No. Oh. So we've got 5000 10000 $15,000 a month marketing yeah. packages that go oh. with that. That five bucks a month for hosting is right, not right, where we're right, making right, our money. Yeah. Right. Well, if you were doing like a long system with them, you'd probably set up something like a retainer base too, or have you done that? Which is what we typically do, actually. Yeah. Our ongoing development um, is we do 50 hour development blocks. Yeah. So they pay 50 hours in advance, and when it gets to within five hours of running out, they renew it. Yeah. So it's, again, it keeps control to them. They know exactly what they have. They have access to our teamwork system. They can log in, see how many hours have been used on what they, usually have a pretty good relationship. Like, I was kind of sketchy about it, but it's actually worked out okay. My developers, once we develop a deep relationship with that client, I actually allow them to talk directly to developers sometimes, mostly about specifically development requests. Yeah. Yeah. And we still have it come through a group queue, so it's more than one person getting it, because you still have to have the systems of accountability on the back end. Um, but, you know, Tarek and Harry, I mean, you can ask them while they're here, they talk to customers regularly, which 
Most developers never talk to customers. True. That doesn't happen. Yeah. What type of reports do you produce that uh, show the client what they're getting for their money? Our ROI reports. So basically, what they show are all the key metrics. I mean, you kind of you missed the part earlier where I talked about uh, establishing the primary conversion unit. Um, that's one of the core questions that we ask the client: is how would you measure success for this site? We set let them set the rules for that because that makes it easy for us to conform to what we know they're going to be expecting, right? So if a client says the most important thing for me is transactions in my shopping cart, well then that's easy. All I got to do is make the shopping cart ring and we win, right? But if the client says that my most important transaction or my most important conversion unit is a phone call, then we have to use secondary systems like call tracking metrics to be able to capture that data. And then on top of that, we show all the supporting data that shows that provides secondary evidence of the work that we're doing. So we do year over year traffic reports and month over month traffic reports and um, social reports and PPC spend reports and all the rest of that. Like we, we bury them with data, except that we do it in a very clean, friendly, easy to read way where they get a high level dashboard that just has a summary and then they can dig down for as deep as they feel they want to go. Some people never look beyond that first page. That's all I care about. They see the numbers, it's all green, they're good. And it's true, like the analytics for Google Analytics, it can overwhelm you, but if yeah. you have a nice clean dashboard that tells you exactly what you need, then you're fine. And Clickfolio is really good at that. I, I kind of wish I had a demo to show you all. I only have live client data, and I don't think I'm actually allowed to do that. But um, look that up, Clipfolio. It's spelled with a K. It's it's a really good platform. Um, it, it will allow you to take any of the reporting systems or tracking systems that you're using and pull it all in into a nice dashboard that you can lay out. One question. I just want to comment that it's it's a nice way to get clients, but I think a lot of businesses, whether it's a one end shop or big company, whatever, the problem is keeping the clients. I mean, is this a great how to to gain clients? But I think the problem and I think that I think that says a lot about your business because it's not how you become successful. You can get your more business not saying it's necessarily what makes you so successful. It's you have all this all this stuff that makes your the transparency, the 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 wanting to help well, it's building the partnership. Once you build the partnership with the client, yeah. that's actually what allows you to continue staying with them for the long range. Right. Because they realize that you're actually trying to help them become profitable. Mm -hmm. And you know that, that's kind of the whole point about like when you're getting a job with a company, when you interview with that company, you want to be with them for the long term. You don't want to just be there to get that next little jump up. You really do want to help them get there. But companies don't tend to have that loyalty to employees that often. So the goal would be, uh, even if you are a self-employed person, is to get beyond that and recognize that me making you profitable makes me profitable, and we work together, and we can actually create a long-term goal. Because um, it, that's kind of the goal of like life. You know, we want to enjoy what we do. That's what I was saying on that second little last slide. That one of the results of that was that our clients have, on average, extended their relationships with us by twelve months. Mm -hmm. um, we make sure that it's understood up front that part of our core why is we want to build a long-term relationship to make you successful. Our core mission is to empower those with the will to succeed. And if you're the kind of person who has the will to succeed, we are the kind of company that can give you the tools to make that happen. And when you establish a belief statement like that, and then you deliver on it, come yeah. and get my customers. <laughs> Try. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Well, I haven't heard from you yet. Okay, what if uh, the customers request is, you know, I want my phone to ring, and then you make their phone ring, and they don't have people set up on their end to answer the phone. <laughs> This has actually happened know, several times. We had a client who we were sending them all sorts of calls, and they kept complaining that um, they like this. These calls are no good. We're not getting any business out of them. Okay, well, it's not like I'm paying for calls to come to your phone. We're just you know putting you out on Google and seeing what happens. So what we did was we did our own discovery on that. Um, call tracking metrics allows you to record and review calls. And so we spent 30 days and we listened to 500 hours of phone calls. Oh and we found every single instance where a receptionist is like, I don't even do that. And bad sales and calls not answered and all the rest of that. And we took them back and we gave them a list of links to those recorded audio files. And we said, you fundamentally have a sales problem in your organization. We have some partners who do sales consultation and referral. They'd be happy to come in and train your people to be better salespeople. And we never heard from that client again about <laughs> how they were converting because it was clear that it wasn't our issue. Yeah. The phone was ringing. 
And that's our PCU. That's what you and I agreed on. This is how you're going to measure the success of this site. What happens after that? That's within your organization to fix. And I don't have the power. How far do you go beyond what the client requests when you know there's a better value proposition lying in wait for that company? Can you clarify that a little more? For example, you, they're telling you what they want. Mm -hmm. but you know based on your experience that there's a much better strategy, yep. value, to doing things a different way and, 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 and giving them something more than what they're really asking for because of their lack of knowledge. But, but they're resistant. To your experience. How often do you find yourself in, yourself in those situations and how do you handle them? About once or twice a year, I get a customer who, despite the fact that they trust their brain surgeon, despite the fact that they trust their regular doctor, despite the fact that they trust all the other professionals in their life, they decide that they are a marketing or design or development expert. And despite the fact that they're going to pay us premium dollars to work on their project, they're going to tell us specifically how it goes their lack of software architecture skills notwithstanding. Uh, if they don't listen and we are already contracted, like this is the only way this ever actually happens. Because if they don't listen to a discovery, and you missed that part as well, if they don't hit my step one, then we're not gonna work together. This is just not gonna happen. Um, I am only gonna work with clients that I feel like I can be successful with. Because anything else hurts my portfolio. And I don't want garbage in my portfolio. And what's more, it's probably also gonna cost me money. I'm going to spend way more time and hours than we're contracted. They're going to complain and not want to pay those extra hours, even though it's their fault. Maybe at the end of it, they're wildly unhappy and threatened to sue us or actually file suit. These kinds of things all happen. So if I get a customer who in discovery is already resistant, man, go somewhere else. I've got so many local agencies in town who love me because I feed them business constantly. If you don't hit my budget requirements or my partnership requirements, Listen, I got three other people for you to call. I think y'all will be a good match, not with me. Now, when that happens, when you're already contracted and you're in a project, mm -hmm. that sucks. That's a whole different ball. Yeah, right? that, that's, kind of, that's kind of like where I was leaving. How do you deal with it? So what I typically do in that particular point is we will make about two attempts to reset the conversation and get everybody back on track. And if those two attempts don't work, then we strip down their current shifting request model to the barest minimum of what will be required to fulfill that. We remove all of our branding from them. We remove them entirely from our portfolio. We deliver to the letter of the statement of work and we close it out and fire them as a client. Yeah. You actually have that in your, in your contract, right? being able to fire. Yep. That's important. Because, you know, at the, at the end of the day, let's, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not an indentured servant. I'm not, you know, somebody who's just going to be whipped around. I'm trying to be your business partner. You know what I mean? I want us to be successful together. And if we're not on the same page with that, then our whys don't align. And I don't want to do business with you any more than you want to do business with me, you know? And I probably missed this earlier, but do you actually assume marketing questions for the business as well? Do I assume what? Does your company also assume the marketing function for a business? Oh yeah, we actually have an outsourced marketing department. Uh, not outsourced to us, but it's literally a product offer in your outsourced marketing department. It's a product symphony? Yes, okay. yeah. Okay. So that's not my side of the house, but they do a pretty good job at it. Okay. It, it's, it seems like you, you went from a, like you're talking, went from a lower end client to a higher end client. Yes. I was wondering what, how much of your like customer acquisition process changed as far as money spent, hours spent, you know, I know you said you hit your first few paragraphs and you decided whether you're going to move on or not, but how do you gather that type and, and weed that process out? You know, that's almost a whole other talk on its own because um, the process is not easy. Um, Part of it, I think, you actually. more time and money on this? Or yeah, if, if I'm, if I'm going to summarize it here in a quick answer so that we don't spend like an hour just on that topic, <laughs> um, my actual marketing strategies have not changed. They've always been authority marketing. That's fundamentally where I live. And so it really came down to consistency and execution. I started off with smaller clients because that was all I could get because no one knew who I was. And every time I created a new solution or solved another problem or something along that line, I write a white paper about it. I publish it. I go share it out on social media. I do these things. I started to build somewhat of a social media following on there. Um, companies who I'd done business with started talking about me. You know, and so it literally went from 
I build a site for a two-person shop to I build a site for a mid-sized company to ABI, SBL, a billion dollar a year company messages me on Facebook, like of all ways to get in touch with me, and we built their new corporate website. You know, um, that's that's a completely different thing from pure discovery here. That's really just about the long-term build. But I think authority marketing is probably the single most fundamental important thing to getting into those spaces. It's not going to be PPC. It's not going to be how beautiful your website is. Uh, our website at Symphony sucked forever. We had a one pager and we were still pulling in these accounts. You know, mm -hmm. um, it really is fundamentally about your track record, your execution, your portfolio, your how much authority you build in the space. Well, would you say too that changing your pricing structure, like actually going from the 2,000, 5,000 to actually saying right off the bat, we're not doing anything with less than a budget of this. It changes the type of client you get. Right? Yeah, I worked. Right. I spent almost 15 years in corporate America. Most of the companies that I worked for were software companies: WebMD, um, Caremedic, Ivan, Sage, Best. You know, um, one of the rules I learned there was that big corporations won't buy server software if the licenses aren't like 10 grand per server minimum. You know, if it's less than that, they think it's garbage. So, like, you really have to kind of fundamentally price your offerings according to your the clients that you want. Yeah, just change. That one question. You, had, uh, you said you can make the phone ring and you can make these cars roll and all that wonderful stuff, and that sounded so easy. <laughs> is, can you build that into the functionality of the site, or how are you doing that? Or do you get budgets to spend on, on Google stuff? Or a combination of all those things. Yeah, I mean, we have we have a recurring marketing package, a monthly marketing package, that includes content marketing, uh, SEO, historical optimization, social media platform stuff, paid um, paid marketing on Facebook. Paid Google, oh, okay. you know, there's a whole suite of services that go oh, to that. Okay. It's certainly not just build a site and they will come. Yeah, that was <laughs> so nice. I had one client. I think was like um, it was the main focus of her job was to get conversions, was to get lead conversion from that one input form to an actual that person contacts and says, "I want to buy your franchise," and all I had to track was the conversion ratio from the form. That's all I had to track to prove the value. And sometimes that's all that's necessary for that kind of stuff. Okay. So just look at that's what he was talking about the price per is price conversion primary, conversion. primary cost unit or conversion, conversion. Unit. yeah. So that was the big one was to build that into your process. Oh, sure. Any other questions? Oh, you guys are still talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So rewind the clock back to when you first started. What advice would you have for someone just starting out now? Oh my god, buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't be a fun guy. <laughs> um, I, I was very comfortable in corporate America for 15 years. The crash happened in 2007, 2008. Um, I had had a well-funded startup that we put together. It crashed hard. It was uh, pretty devastating. Um, I assumed I would go back and do a corporate America job. I put my resume back out and nothing happened for two years. And I just started doing contract work on the side because I had to do something to make money. I'd run through all my savings and I'd gone through all whatever resources I had. And um, now the first two and a half years, we pretty well starved. And then it turned the corner, you know? It was just about keeping at it, really, more than anything else. Working it constantly. And recognizing you have value. I think yeah, that's it's... a big one, is that people don't tend to recognize the fact they have value. They don't realize that the jobs they've done before, the work, the experience they brought through that lifetime is valuable. When I first started doing development freelance, I was pricing it at the rates that I was making as a salary employee. So I started off working for like 25 bucks an hour, 30 bucks an hour, you know? And then I was like, man, this is not enough. And so I went to like 45 bucks an hour. And then I was uh, actually with the Entrepreneur Social Club. I was doing work with a lot of the folks who were in there. And literally, my clients are like, you're cheap. <laughs> you know? And so I raised my rates like twice in one year, all of a sudden, 65, 75, and 95 an hour. And it's like, hey, this is still working and business is still coming in. And I'm working less and making more money, you know, which was a great thing. You know? we had and when I joined Symphony, they were charging 95 bucks an hour for development as an agency. And that's what I was charging individually. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, no, this has got to go up. You know? We had uh, one of the folks was actually here at one of our meetups, and one of his questions was, you know, why does it cost so much for a website? And as you know, Elena and Greg and I were at dinner with them, and we were talking about it, and we said, you basically, you got to recognize what the website is doing for you. That's an employee at your business. 
How much would you charge to have a 24-7 person funneling phone calls into you and giving you sales calls? Depends on how competent he is, right? Exactly, yeah. So the better the website, the more competent the website, the more it's worth to the, to the company. Yeah. You had a question? You? Yeah, well, actually, going back to your charging per hour, one of the things I learned, and this is back in the 80s, so we can extrapolate the numbers. Um, I put an ad in a newspaper, that's when you can still do that. And, um, <laughs> For a, a programmer, and I didn't really know that much in 1988, but I just wanted to get started. So I put an ad out for $15 an hour. Okay? And I got nothing. Okay? And somebody said, You have a great ad, just change it to $40 an hour. Okay? Do, do, and, I, and I didn't understand, being a young man at the time. Why I could make forty? Nobody's calling me at fifteen, okay. But why would anybody call me at forty? Well, it's back when programmers wore shirts and ties. I changed. Shirts and I, I, changed yeah. I changed it to forty, and I never looked back. And one of the things I also got got out of that was this: if you charge, and then I my thought was, if I charge forty, by the way, I charge seventy-five now. <laughs> but uh, but if I charge 40, what if I can't do the job? And a really simple answer. You work for three hours and you charge one for one. And there's your fifteen dollars. Okay? Sit out. So you can you can always pare down your price, but not you know, if you can always get the value out to the customer. Um, you just have to work harder. But at the same time, you have the perceived value. Nobody called me at 15 and because nobody thought I knew what I was doing. That's why you have to start the budget. Yeah, the first question. What's your budget? I love that question. We always ask it right up front. You have to. Because <laughs> if they haven't thought it out, then they, they're not serious about what they're actually doing. I uh, Back when I first started, before I even had the, the very first company going, when I was just like dabbling in entrepreneurship, I had a friend of mine who ran a carpet company and I was talking about the struggle with like, I would make this pitch and then it would get to the point where I had to ask for the money and I'd be like, how do I do that? And, and I'm like, how do you do it? And he's like, I go, is that cash or credit? <laughs> you know, like he was so excited to ask for the money when he was pitching, you know, and you know, entrepreneurs, especially freelancers, you know, when you're really wanting it and you really need it and you get hung up on that, it can be one of the scariest things in the world, but uh, it's, just go all out, go at it, go grab it. The worst that's going to happen is they're going to say no, and then you go on to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Back to what Jim said earlier about it, you know, one of the questions that I have is how do how do you how do you how, when you're dealing with smaller clients, sometimes it's, it's difficult to sell the the, the the value of the website, the true value of it. Especially, especially when they've not had a real website that's been optimized and you know you know to 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 to, to do the conversion that it, that, that it should do so how how do you win that client when you really do want to work with them man that's a tough question i gotta tell you because you know when you told me like they don't even have a real website and they you know they're not sure about the value you know I, it starts with how well can you articulate the value, but at the end of the day, like, I mean, for me, I take a hard pass on those clients, you know? Let somebody who's who's fresh out of college, let them build it, you know what I mean? It's, it's hard to turn a profit on clients like that because they don't understand the value of it. And no matter how well you articulate it, you know, if you've got like, like restaurants, restaurants can be the worst clients in the they world and bars, you know, because they don't care. It's turn and burn, you know, they've got 50 different sites like Urban Spoon and all this who want to feature all their stuff for free. They're getting traffic from everywhere. And typically the best place they see conversions from is social media. Yeah. You know, people follow the restaurant's Facebook page and they post up a $20 special and people come flood in you know those kind of clients it's like do you want to do the work to develop a website for them you know I want the clients who are gonna who are going to be those long-term partners you know and I want clients who need what I'm gonna do and those clients just don't really need it that much if you can't clearly articulate the value to their business they just don't need it that much you're also talking about five million to a hundred million dollar well, business now but that was well, now yeah, yeah yeah but but I mean if, if 
if it's much less than that, they really don't have the money for you. So they, if they have the money for an employee, they have the money for a website. And that's that, that's a, uh, no seriously. They no, do. that's true. That's true. I, I know. Well, what I've been telling people is you can't afford <laughs> not to have the website if you're in business. Well, you except that if I'm Joe's tires, I probably can. can. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, honestly, most businesses that are, there's a lot of, like you said, restaurants don't really need a website. They need, they need a presence that needs to be there, but honestly, social media is their primary input. And that's why I guarantee the worst websites you'll see on the internet today are restaurant websites. Yeah. Generally, they are terrible. They never have the hours, they never have the phone number, they never have a map. They were built 10 years ago. They got like some flash thing with some music going on. They don't have the menu. All I wanted a restaurant website is the menu, the phone number, and the hours. They exactly. never have it. Never. You know? Those are the three things, always. So, there, you know, it depends on how much, like, how much time and effort is it going to take you to build that site. If you're going to go get Avada and slap it on a, a $5 a month host and throw some plugins in there and configure it, you can knock their whole thing out in four hours, then there you go. You can articulate the value for that. Yeah. But if you're actually going to spend some time developing a site, I mean, we build our themes and plugins from the ground up. We use five repo plugins, everything else we write from scratch. Um, like, there's no point in me even in, in, in having a conversation with someone who has like five grand to spend for a website build because our project management's going to eat up five grand before we write the first line of code. Yeah. You know? And you're going to find that too when Big C comes in in September. That's going to be their conversation as well because that's a lot of it is that. They don't even start, just like Symphony does, yep. they don't even start really even thinking about putting anything to code until discovery is completely handled. Yep. Because that's where you provide your value to your clients, is in the long-term value of the project you're working on. They're actually very comparable to us in yep. who they target and the services. They also do all development in-house, which is yep. part of our value propositions. Yep. I know those guys, Joe and Andy and all of them, they're cool. Yep. Why do real estate people have... Why are web designers just like real estate? Oh, that's so funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because they're a dime a dozen and they, they hate spending money that they're not getting a royalty on. And <laughs> What's funny is, uh, so uh, I, I built the site for Southern Roots, uh, which is a, a big real estate company down here, and they just won a big award for like best real estate website or something, uh, like a year after I bought it or whatever. I, I, in my opinion, it's the freaking MLSs and IDXs. It's dealing with those systems is such a pain. They are not modern at all. Typically, you have to embed. Most of them don't have good APIs. Like you have to jump through so many hoops to accomplish that core function, which is to show my listings, you know? Right. right. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, yeah. it just makes it a hassle. And the realtor never understands that complexity. They're just like, well, this guy over here, I, mean, I went to the Remax site and their stuff looks good. Well, Remax spent $250,000 on that site and you want to spend five, yeah. you know? So, <laughs> you know? Well, that's kind of the thing is like, if you want those kind of sites, go to work with those particular realtor agencies exactly. and go yeah. away. We don't really want to. And talk. then they'll give you a Remax.com slash Becky or whatever, yeah. you know? I mean, yeah. but it's, there, there's, there's a disconnect on that a lot, you know? And that's, and that's one of those things. Part of discovery is not just figuring out what the client's needs are, but it's figuring out if they're your client. You know, not everyone who comes and talks to you is going to be your client. You got to find that person who's a good match for you, or that company that's a good match for you, someplace where you can truly add value, where your whys align. You know. Okay. Chris, thank you very much. I'm glad y'all enjoyed it. We are WordPress St. Petersburg. We meet on the first and second Thursday monthly at the Iron Yard St. Pete. Uh, our first meetup of the month is usually geared toward a talk, and our second meetup of the month is usually a workshop based, a little more informal. Uh, you can find out all about uh, WordPress Tampa Bay, which is a uh, basically all of our meetups for WordPress across the entire Tampa Bay region. We have six regional areas. Uh, we can find out all about us at our website at tampabaywp.org. We have a Slack chat there where you can uh, easily communicate with other people and uh, ask questions and, you know, get involved and uh, build your community. We also have a Facebook group, and, of course, we have our meetups. Uh, we're currently in the transition phase of moving our six different regional meetups into their own separate little meetup calendars on meetups.com. And... Uh, transitioning away from having all of them on the same calendar, which is our Tampa Bay WordPress calendar meetup. 
So uh, we'd like to thank the Iron Yard St. Pete in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida here. Uh, this wonderful facility is made available to us every month to do our meetups and uh, they're really easy to work with. Iron Yard St. Pete is a tech school. They have a very intense uh, crash course boot camp, uh, very well uh, driven coding class for front enders and back enders, iOS apps, the whole thing. You can find out all about them on their website at the ironyard.com. Uh, 